think uh, of all the many misunderstood or misconceived principles that we find in the Bible, especially by Christians and modern Judaism as well, but one that's, I think, so indispensable for God's followers, I think at the top of that list has to be the concept of atonement that is expressed in the Hebrew word kippur. And we concluded the last lesson by discussing this term and one or two of its offshoots, such as uh, kofer and kapara. And I want to resurrect that thought just for a moment, because as we've learned and, and what was in the minds of the writers of the Bible and the culture they lived, that ancient Hebrew culture, it's one that's so distant from modern thought that it can really be challenging to apprehend it, let alone to comprehend it. But it is really important if we're going to get the true understanding that the Lord wants us to have regarding His laws and His plans. Now, the notion of ransoming a person from the wrath of, of a God for a price, and this includes the God of Israel, was prevalent in ancient cultures. And it is equally as prevalent in the Bible. The church especially, but Judaism as well, has tried all sorts of allegorical trickery to reconcile our 21st century minds to the words of scriptures, a scripture on this subject, and we've effectively blunted the impact it really ought to have upon us. We typically find that the literal concept of ransom-based atonement is just too primitive for us. So we twist it and we remold it until it is comfortable. And I promise you that if we were to enter a time machine and go back, say, to King David's era, tell them what atonement and redemption means and our modern understanding of it, it would be unrecognizable to them. Proverbs is but one of the many books where we get this thought about the fundamental God principle of ransom and its irreplaceable purpose. Proverbs 20 21, 18. The wicked serve as a ransom for the righteous and likewise the perfidious for the upright. See, this is an excellent biblical statement to make my point. This passage literally says that the termination of the lives of wicked people, meaning those who deny the God of Israel, is an acceptable payment to Jehovah to appease him in order that the righteous people, meaning those who are devoted to the God of Israel, receive forgiveness for their sins. It's an exchange that God has said will satisfy him. And please note, we're not speaking of the righteous killing of the wicked and then offering them up to God, but rather of God taking out his wrath upon the wicked in whatever manner he determines he wants to do. I want to put it another way. This is not an act of men upon men. This is an act of God upon men. Despite standard teaching to the contrary, there is no principle of God that has ceased to exist nor has it changed. Thus, the central place of ransom as a way to satisfy the justice that God inherently requires can't be overlooked. There can't be some kind of obsolete protocol that was only for more primitive humans. Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life of a creature is in the blood. And... I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for yourselves. Because it's the blood that makes atonement because of the life. It's God's very nature that he cannot accept that what he's created can be killed without the killer being subject to his righteous wrath. I want you to hear me on this. Just as we like to say that God can never tell a lie, oh, Christians love to say that one, neither can he not be angered by the unjust death of one of his creatures. 
And when I say can't, I mean can't. Just as God is not capable of lying, so he's not capable of not being angered at the spilling of innocent blood. It's not a matter of limitation. It's not a matter of preference. Rather, it's his essence. It's his character. This is what makes him who he is. This is also explains why he does what he does. Thus, the God principle is that one of his creatures must pay for the unjust death of another of his creatures. Always. And this is reflected in a number of ways. For instance, when it comes to sinning, trespassing against God, the guilty party's transgression must be paid for by an innocent party if it's to be forgiven. Otherwise, the guilty party's blood is on his own head, and God's Anger is satisfied only when the guilty party's life is taken. Therefore, forgiveness is not granted. So in the sacrificial system, it is an innocent animal that's slaughtered as a ransom paid so that the guilty person's life is spared by God. Why is this necessary in every case without exception? Because God is holy. Because God is perfect, and he can't even let one instant slide. Otherwise, his righteous anger will not be appeased, and his holiness will become defiled, and that is just not something he's going to let happen. Even when it comes to killing and butchering an animal for food, legitimately, that animal's blood has to be given back to God as a payment of ransom the death of that animal at the hands of a human. It is an act of appeasement for the justice of the Lord for the killing of one of his creatures, whether it's a lawful or unlawful killing. See, thus it's an imperative that we see that the word atonement is woven all throughout the Bible. It's used so commonly within Judeo-Christianity, it encompasses a huge range of meaning. Not different meanings for different situations, but rather atonement is cosmically complex in concept. And it has many facets integrated into it. Atonement in its simplest form means a payment, means a ransom, it means a substitute, a just requirement of a holy God of which not one other thing will do. Who does this payment go to? God. Why does it go to him? Because his righteous justice must be appeased and he determined that this is what will satisfy him. There is no other choice. We can't make one up. We can't substitute whatever we feel like. Who benefits from atonement? Us. His worshipers, who would otherwise live in our guilt before the Lord. Now, let's see the same God principle of Kippur in action in yet another setting. Redemption. Turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 8. Numbers chapter 8. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 157. We're going to start reading at verse... I'm just going to read a couple of verses, 16, 17, and 18. I'll start at 15. After that, the Levites will enter and do the service of the tent of meeting. You will cleanse them and offer them as a wave offering because they are entirely given to me from among the people of Israel. I have taken them for myself in place of all those who come first out of the womb, that is, the firstborn males of the people of Israel. For all the firstborn among the people of Israel are mine, both humans and animals. On the day I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I set them apart for myself. But I have taken the Levites in place of all the firstborn among the people of Israel. This is a great opportunity to look back and review for a few minutes. 
Jehovah reminds us that redemption is a costly thing. It can only occur with a price, a ransom being paid. And when he determined to redeem Israel out of the hand of Egypt, that redemption price was all firstborns were to become his holy property. Not just all firstborns of Israel. All firstborns of Egypt as well. These firstborns were designated to be a sacrifice, essentially, or a ransom for all other people. So when it came time for Israel to leave Egypt, God would call in his marker. All firstborns of people and cattle, meaning domesticated animals, of Egypt and Israel would be literally sacrificed, slaughtered, killed, to pay the price for Israel being redeemed from slavery. However, even though all firstborns now belong to God and were marked to be a sacrifice for atonement, a price, he would not sacrifice those firstborns who trusted him enough to follow his, prov his provision that every home was to slaughter a lamb, substitute, and paint its blood on the doorposts of their home. In other words, that lamb would be the payment for all the firstborns who were rightfully set up to be slaughtered as a sacrifice. We know this event as the Passover. The result was that the vast majority of Israel believed God. So the Israelite firstborns were saved, but the vast majority of the Egyptian firstborn did not believe God, and so the Egyptian firstborns were slaughtered as a ransom, the price of atonement for the Israelites. As Proverbs 21 says, the wicked were a ransom for the righteous. Now that Israel has escaped Egypt, the firstborns of Israel still, still weren't out of the woods. They were still God's holy property. They owed God now a lifetime of service. Therefore, Jehovah in his mercy decided that the Levites would become the substitute, a ransom, for all the Israelite firstborns. And rather than all the Israelite firstborns from all 12 tribes remaining God's holy property, subject to service to God, now the Levites, one tribe of Israel, would become God's holy property in their place. And the firstborns of the 12 tribes would then be relieved of their responsibility of a lifetime service to him. That is why the census that we read of earlier in Numbers was so carefully conducted. Recall that the number of Levite males that were available to substitute on a one-for-one -one basis for each Israelite firstborn fell short of the needed amount. Therefore, those Israelite firstborns who had no Levite to redeem them instead had to pay money to the priesthood for their redemption. Redemption always has a tangible cost. But since God requires a blood sacrifice which the firstborns of Egypt paid for Israel's redemption, this requirement still lay upon the firstborns of Israel, who now passed that burden off of their shoulders, and according to God's instruction, on to the Levites, who then passed the blood sacrifice part of that requirement off of their shoulders on to the bulls that were sacrificed. So we see this long chain of substitution being established. Kind of a kick the can down the road process. Eventually that can stopped and it all fell on Yeshua's shoulders. He was the final and best substitute for atonement. He could either have accepted becoming the literal blood atonement sacrifice as he did or he could have laid it on an animal, like humankind had always done.
And then the cycle of sin, sacrifice, atonement would simply have continued. It is the Torah that carefully establishes God's requirements for redemption by means of blood sacrifice. And it also establishes that his justice can be satisfied with an authorized substitute as a ransom to pay for what each of us rightly owes him. The final few verses of Numbers chapter 8 only reiterate that those Levites who do heavy work retire from that heavy work at age 50. That does not mean they're excused from service. They became temple guards, temple watchmen. They did other sorts of labor that wouldn't overly tax a, an older person. Now, next, we're going to examine the second Passover. The first Passover having occurred the night before Israel left Egypt. So let's move on now to Numbers chapter 9. Now, Numbers chapter 9 and 10 join together to record all the final preparations for the journey of Israel, now released and redeemed from Egypt, outfitted with God's sanctuary, prepared with God's laws and commandments, now they're ready to set out for the promised land. Did you hear that list of requirements? Released and redeemed, outfitted with God's presence with them, his sanctuary, prepared with his laws and commandments, now they can set out for the promised land. That makes sense, doesn't it? It's been 600 years since Jehovah made his covenant with Abraham that a place had been set aside for the set-apart people to live in. And that place is what at the time was called the land of Canaan. But in the near future, it would be renamed Israel. So, open your Bibles to Numbers chapter 9. We're going to read it all. We have a complete Jewish Bible. It is page 158. Adonai spoke to Moshe in the Sinai Desert in the first month of the second year after they had left the land of Egypt. And he said... Let the people of Israel observe Pesah, Passover, at its designated time. On the 14th day of this month, at dusk, you are to observe it at its designated time. You are to observe it according to all of its rules and regulations. Moses told the people of Israel to observe Passover. So they observe Passover at dusk on the 14th day of the month of the, in the Sinai Desert. The people of Israel acted in accordance with all that Adonai had ordered Moses. But, there were certain people who had become unclean because of someone's corpse, so that they couldn't observe Passover on that day. So they came before Moses and Aaron that day and said to him, We're unclean because of someone's corpse. Why must we be kept from bringing the offering for Adonai at the time designated for the people of Israel? And Moses answered them, Wait, so that I can hear from Adonai uh, what Adonai will order concerning you. And Adonai said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel, if any of you now or in a future generation is unclean because of a corpse or he's on a trip abroad, nevertheless, he is to observe Passover. But he will observe it in the second month on the 14th day at dusk. They are to eat it with matzah and maror, and they are to leave none of it until morning. They are not to break any of its bones. They are to observe it according to all the regulations of Pesach. But the person who is clean... And not on a trip, who fails to observe Passover will be cut off from his people. Because he did not bring the offering for Adonai at its designated time, that person will bear the consequences of his sin. If a foreigner is staying with you and wants to observe Passover for Adonai, he is to do it according to the regulations and rules of Passover. You are to have the same law for the foreigners as well as for the citizens of the land. And on the day the tabernacle was put up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, that is, the tent of testimony, and in the evening over the tabernacle was what appeared to be fire, which remained until morning. So the cloud always covered it, and it looked like fire at night. And whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tent, the people of Israel continued their travels. They camped wherever the cloud stopped. 
And at the order of Adonai, the people of Israel traveled. At the order of Adonai, they camped. And as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they stayed in camp. Even when the cloud remained on the tabernacle for a long time, the people of Israel did what Adonai had charged them to do, and they did not travel. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle. According to Adonai's order, they remained in camp, and according to Adonai's order, they traveled. Sometimes the cloud was there only from evening until morning, so that when the cloud was taken up in the morning, they traveled. Or even if it continued up both day and night when the cloud was up, they traveled. Whether it was two days, a month, a year, the cloud remained over the tabernacle, staying on it, the people of Israel remained in camp and they did not travel. But as soon as it was taken up, they traveled. At Adonai's order, they camped. At Adonai's order, they traveled. They did what Adonai had charged them to do through Moses. Now the first thing spoken of in Numbers chapter 9 is the Passover, Pesach in, in, in Hebrew. This is the second Passover that's being celebrated by Israel, and there's a distinct difference in the way that this Passover will be observed as compared to the very first one in Egypt. Let's remember that the first Passover took place in Egypt on that great and terrible night that the Lord killed all unprotected firstborns in Egypt. The only firstborns exempted were those who followed Moses' instructions that they were to kill a yearling male lamb, eat it, and spread its blood on the doorposts of their mud brick homes. Now, it is a key God principle to understand that while this instruction was primarily aimed at Israel, any family living in Egypt, Hebrew or not, no matter their nationality, their race, their ethnicity, who worshipped Jehovah and obeyed and followed this commandment, they were passed over by death. Any family who was circumcised male led as a sign of joining Israel could participate, and many did. As a result, we see in Exodus that a mixed multitude of people left Egypt and traveled with Israel. Some who came officially joined Israel. Others were just Hitchhikers who never joined Israel. They probably had lost their firstborn and they were awed by God's power. So they wanted to live among Israel. They wanted to enjoy all the benefits that this God brought. So three categories of people left Egypt. Natural-born Israelites, Hebrews. Second of all, those of other nationalities who wished to officially become Israelites, to join Israel. And third, those who had no intention of becoming Israelites, they just wanted to live among Israel for all kinds of reasons. While they retained their identities, and the Bible usually refers to those who were not natural-born Israelites, but who wished to become Israelites as sojourners. And this is apart and distinct from those hitchhikers who are referred to as strangers or resident aliens. Now, the second Passover is, if you would, the first commemoration of the Egyptian Passover. And all Passovers from here forward would be commemorations of that first Passover in Egypt. In other words, the first Passover was the historical event. And then every Passover after that was a remembrance of of that event, of the Egyptian Passover. The main difference between the first Passover in Egypt and the second Passover out in the wilderness is that in between the two of them, the Torah, the law, was given to Israel on Mount Sinai. Further, a place for God to dwell among Israel, the tabernacle, had been constructed. And as a result, the character and the nature of the Passover lamb changed somewhat. In the first Passover, each individual family slaughtered their own lamb in their own home as there was no common place to do so. There was no priesthood to officiate. Further, while that first Passover lamb was sacrificed, it was killed for a divine purpose, it was not a 
formal sacrifice, as in the new mold of sacrifices that was now ordained in Leviticus. With the giving of the law, all sacrifices that were to be held at the tabernacle had to be supervised by priests. And I have no doubt that it was those firstborns of Israel who were going to be passed over who did the slaughtering of the lamb in that first Passover, but they would not be allowed to in the future. And we discussed kind of recently that until the Levitical priesthood was established at Mount Sinai, which happened a year after the first Passover, it was traditional that the firstborns of each family kind of acted like the family priest. So since the slaughtering of the lamb was the divinely ordained, it would have fallen to the firstborn to kill the lamb. Now there's a lot of symbolism here. It was the lives of the firstborns who were threatened by God. So it was the firstborns who killed the lamb and did the smearing of the blood. Sometimes we get a wrong impression about this first Passover. It was not to save, think about this, the physical lives of all the Israelites from death. Women and non-firstborns weren't subject to God's death threat. His wrath was only going to be poured out on the firstborns. Because it was the firstborns that he declared belonged to him. And he was willing to sacrifice them, so to speak, in order to save his people. The killing of those firstborns was the ransom. It was the redemption price for Israel, satisfying his justice. So it was each person who was subject to condemnation, in Egypt that meant the firstborns, that had to slaughter the lamb and appropriate, appropriate those saving qualities of its blood. And I hope you see this. Every person had to do this. Every firstborn. The firstborn who slaughtered the lamb was appropriating its blood for himself. Now in the end, it led to his whole family escaping the slavery of Egypt. But this was not about saving the physical lives of his other family members. Because their physical lives were never in danger. It's exactly like that today for mankind. Every person subject to condemnation by God, which is everybody, must appropriate the blood of the sacrifice for him or herself. As much as I might want to, I cannot appropriate Yeshua's blood for my brother or my sister, for my mother or my father, or for my children or for my grandchildren. I can't. Oh, how I want to. Every person must be redeemed one by one by his own free will choice. But a person within a household who does appropriate Yeshua's sacrificial blood does open a door for his family to escape by showing them the way. Still, each family member must now go and obtain the saving power of Yeshua for him or herself. And as was ordained in Leviticus, the Passover was to occur on the 14th day. And this rule is repeated here in Numbers 9, verse 3, along with the regulation that the sacrifice of the lamb should occur in Hebrew in the Bain Ha'arbim. Right? And this literally means between the two evenings. So exactly when is that? Well, most ancient rabbis determined it was between sunset and complete darkness. Later it was determined that it meant what we would call about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And between 3 o'clock in the afternoon and then the time of total darkness. And remember, the Hebrew day begins in, in, in the evening, not the morning. Like, is pretty much universal around the world among Gentile nations today. 
More specifically, it's not at dark that the day ends, but when that final edge of the sun disappears over the horizon. Even more specifically, it's when three stars in the sky can be seen that now the current day ends and a new one begins. Obviously, it was humanly impossible for these priests to officiate over the thought slaughtering of thousands upon thousands of lambs in the few minute interval between the sun setting and complete darkness. So one can understand the reason for declaring that the slaughter of the lambs should start at three in the afternoon. There is scholarly and there's rabbinical disagreement over whether or not the Passover in the wilderness required that the lambs be slaughtered by the priests at the tabernacle. And then that requirement changed once they entered the promised land. Now what is interesting is that there is no mention of the Feast of Matzah here. That is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That feast is to begin the day after Passover. And from the timing of these passages, we can know that the Passover occurred on the 14th and Israel left their journey from Sinai into the wilderness on the 20th. There's no way they were going to leave in the middle of the Feast of Matzah. And the reason I point this out is that just as God ordained in Leviticus, Passover and Matzah, although connected, are two distinctly different observances. It was only in later times that they were so intimately connected that they became looked at as just one big combined feast. Even today, it's common to call the period of time that includes the Passover and then unleavened bread is simply Passover. Some prefer to call the combined feast matzah. Many Jews today treat Passover as just the first day of matzah. But that's not really correct by the Torah commandments. Now there's a very important reason the Passover had to be celebrated before they packed up and left. It involved the sacrificing of animals. Matzah did not have a sacrificial element. The only requirement was to clean out one's dwelling of leaven and to eat unleavened bread, matzah, during the seven-day period of the feast. Therefore, while the tabernacle was essential, beginning at Mount Sinai, for proper observance of Passover, the tabernacle was not necessary to observe the seven-day feast of matzah. In fact, one didn't even have to be ritually pure to observe the Feast of Matzah, because there was no sacrificing involved. Verse 6 brings forward a circumstance where some Israelites came to Moses and said this, we have a problem. And the problem was that some number of Israelites had become ritually defiled because they had come into contact with a dead body. In Hebrew, they were Tamene Le Nefesh. But since the focal point of the second Passover was the sacrifice of a lamb, a sacrifice of a lamb, probably at the tabernacle. And because the law didn't allow anyone who was severely unclean to approach the sanctuary of God with their sacrifice, then what about those people who were currently unclean? Were they still going to be allowed to participate in the Passover? Those who brought the question to Moses were certainly hoping so. So Moses goes into conference with God over this, and God issues his edict. No, they can't. However, on the 14th day of the following month, this is assuming they're no longer in a state of ritual impurity, then they can celebrate Passover. And verse 11 says, They shall eat the Passover lamb along with bitter herbs and unleavened bread, but they shall leave none of it till morning, no leftovers, no snacks. And then they shall not break a bone of the lamb. This is another element to this whole procedure that's really interesting. It says that in addition to those who are not ritually clean being afforded a makeup date, the 14th of the following month, which means it's the second month of the religious calendar year, that those who are on a long journey can also postpone 
the Nisan 14th Passover by a month. But this exception is strictly for those two conditions alone. Verse 13 states that if somebody doesn't celebrate Passover when, where, and how it's to be ordained, and these two special conditions aren't met, that person's subject to being cut off from his kin, separated from God. Verse 14 continues to reinforce a principle set down in Genesis. But among Israel, there's one law for everyone, whether they're a Hebrew or a foreigner. In other words, those of other nationalities who had thrown their allegiance to Israel, thereby becoming Israelites, they're in the same boat with the natural-born Israelites. There's no difference. All the Torah applies to them, and they're under the same requirements, same blessings, and the same curses. Naturally. Because all who want to be followers of the God of Israel must operate under the same covenant. Further, even the resident aliens who are not Israelites and don't want to be Israelites, but they do live with Israel, they're required to follow the observance of Passover. Now, it's not very hard to imagine that eventually it got to be a pretty big argument over exactly what God meant by long journey. And so who could postpone celebrating Passover? Who could postpone presenting a sacrifice at the tabernacle for 30 days? Just how long is long? In essence, the question boiled down to just how far one was from the tabernacle when Nisan 14th arrived, therefore how far from his home one was required to travel to get to the tabernacle, later the temple, for Passover. And of course, various rabbis came up with various answers. Of what is written and recorded, two main views were established. One, anyone who does not have the physical capacity to reach the te temple or tabernacle is exempt. And the other one is anyone who lived further than 18 miles from the tabernacle or temple was exempt. And this issue and its various solutions no doubt played a role in the gospel accounts of Jesus' death at Passover. We know that the Judeans, that is those Jews who lived in Judah, Judea, and therefore were in very close proximity to the temple, they followed one set of traditional rules, while Jews from the Galilee, where Jesus and his disciples were from, followed another tradition. And this was due to the long distance the Galileans would have to travel to get to and to return from Jerusalem. So the Galileans held their Passover meal on Passover Eve, the day before Passover, due to all the logistics involved. They would have started clearing their houses of leaven earlier than their Judean brothers to the south. So some of the problems that we find in the Gospel accounts of the Passover when Yeshua was crucified and stories about the Lord's Supper can be traced to this issue of a definition of what's a long journey. Just how strictly one had to observe the timing of Passover and what various groups of Jews did to solve this dilemma. Now let me approach a subject that I know some of you don't entirely agree with me on, but I hope you're starting to come around. Get just squared away. Now, I've already touched on the matter of Yeshua and the Passover. The more we learn about the Torah, the more we see the precise parallels between the slaughter of the Paschal Lamb and the crucifixion of Christ, between the Lord's Supper and the Passover Seder meal, from which comes the custom, and it is a custom, of communion. But there's another issue of commonality as well. This issue of clean and unclean people who should not participate as a result of being unclean. Here in Numbers 9, 
A person who is unclean can't participate in Passover. It has to be put off until a month, and it's assumed they are clean now. We see a real similar kind of warning developed in the New Testament. First, the link between Passover and Yeshua is established. In John, 650, starting at 653, Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So after the invitation is established and the reason for participation is laid down, Next, we have a warning. In fact, it's a death threat. 1 Corinthians 11.27 So whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks eats and drinks judgment to himself if he doesn't judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. I've heard any number of guesses and allegorical statements about what drinking and eating in an unworthy matter, manner uh, means. And of course, these various, what I think are fanciful explanations are usually anything but within the context of Israel, Torah, and the Jewish people, which is the only proper context within which to view any part of the Bible. Now, remembering that everything about that Passover meal and the Lord's Supper is a Torah-ordained event. In other words, there's no man-made traditions involved here. There is but one clearly stated condition that makes a person unworthy to participate. And what is it? Being unclean. That's it. That's what an unworthy manner is. Being unclean. It's already defined for us. And of course, the punishment in the Torah for partaking of Passover in an unclean state is you're cut off. Cut off is defined as divine, divine punishment up to and including death. And naturally, as a parallel to the Torah command, Rav Paul, Rav Shaul, warns that those who are unworthy, and I tell you that means unclean, and who drinks the cup and eats the bread anyway becomes sick and weak, and many will fall asleep, which means to die. And just as obviously, the context makes it clear that this is divine retribution. You don't get sick because the bread and the wine were toxic. I hope you see this hard and tight connection between the ordinance of Numbers 9 and the New Testament version of the same thing. The New Testament simply adds to the context by now making Yeshua that Passover lamb. It's all that's changing here. Well, let's move on to verse 15. This begins a section of Numbers 9 that explains the operation of the fire cloud, also known to be the glory of the Lord, and what Israel's response to it ought to be. Now, really, this is but a resumption of something that started earlier in Exodus. Israel had followed the fire cloud all the way from Egypt to Mount Sinai. Since they had been stationary for about 13 months at the base of the mountain, the fire cloud had not been needed to direct their movement, but that was going to change. This sequence of events can be inferred from the circumstances. The fire cloud led them from Egypt to Sinai, then it rose up and rested on top of the mountain where Moses went to receive the Torah, and it rested there for some time. Now that the tabernacle was completed, and it was built after God's heavenly, after the pattern of God's heavenly throne, 
It replaced Mount Sinai. The tabernacle replaced Mount Sinai as God's earthly dwelling place, which itself had replaced the Garden of Eden. So naturally, the fire cloud that we often read about when Moses ascended up to the top of Mount Sinai, it now moved down and rested upon the completed tabernacle. Logical. And during the day, the sunlight more or less hid, uh, hid the brilliance of the fire cloud so that only the cloud itself was seen. But when it grew dark, the fire within the cloud lit up the night sky. Boy, wouldn't you have been just loved to have seen that. <clears throat> I mean, what a sight that must have been. I, I just gives me the shivers. How reassuring it must have been to God's people who were so apprehensive right about now about their future. And beginning in verse 17, we get the drill. When the cloud lifts, then the Israelites are to strike camp, take down the tabernacle, and move, following the fire cloud. When the cloud stops, they stop. I don't care if it's overnight, a week, a month, a year, it doesn't matter. And by the way, this is not saying that the maximum amount of time they stopped in camp was a year. It just means that whether it's for a long time or a short time, they were to follow the fire cloud. That's all it means. The final verse says that on a sign from the Lord that either made camp or broke camp. Now, don't get confused. This sign it's speaking of is the movement of the fire cloud. There's not some additional sign. What we must not overlook is that God's presence as associated with the fire cloud was very real and tangible for these Israelites out in the wilderness. But it only happened because the people of Israel obeyed God. They built for him this complex sanctuary, this tent sanctuary, the tabernacle at his command. It's also interesting to note that we had never heard of the fire cloud in the Bible before the first Passover. It wasn't until after God redeemed his people, Israel, that he appeared to lead them in this type of an intimate, very visible manner that everybody could see. And once he redeemed them, and he became so real and tangible to them, they were expected to respond with their obedience. God leads, they follow. God goes, they go. Where he doesn't go, they don't go. When he stops, they stop. When God says, you stopped long enough, get moving, you get moving. I mean, this is a beautiful, appropriate pattern and demonstration for our walk with God. All this fire cloud imagery, Israel living in tents, temporary dwelling units, is poignantly brought forward into the New Testament so we don't ever doubt that God's patterns have been abolished, made obsolete. They've not we'll find the transfiguration of Christ occurring in a cloud. Later, when he arose and ascended, it was into a cloud. How's he coming back? In a cloud. Two of the leading apostles, Paul and Peter, constantly make use of the metaphor of the human body being likened to a tent, a temporary dwelling place which will re be replaced in time with incorruptible and permanent housing when we've reached our promised land, heaven. All of these examples and patterns and metaphors that we see Yeshua and the apostles use in the New Testament, they're not newly made up. They're not arbitrary. They're not random. They're used because they refer directly to the Torah, the Word of God. And then the purpose, even if they didn't fully recognize it, was to make this ironclad connection 
between the covenant in Christ and the earlier covenants revealed in the Torah. So with that, we'll end today and begin chapter 10 next week. So please rise.